Afghanistan, they say, is the graveyard of empires. And Central Asia, if we look at the archaeology clearly, is the graveyard of unitary nationalist histories. Perhaps no people exemplify this as much as the Sogdians, arguably one of the most influential diasporas in human history, on par with or even surpassing India's own. I'm Anirudh Kanesetti, historian author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below, and remember that we're all figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. In the 7th century CE, the city of Kabul was home to Hindu Turk Shahs, more in this video here. If you were to travel to its north, across the Oxus or the Amudarya River, you would come across a scattering of city-states, squabbling and trading with each other and the world. Within them, you would meet the Sogdians, who were the Buddhists, Mazdais, Zoroastrians, Christians, Jews. Alongside them were diasporas of Central Asians, South Asians, West Asians, or East Asians. And they spoke a babble of languages, primarily Iranic, but with many Indic loanwords. Now, these forgotten people remind us, as always, that the past was a world without borders. To understand the Sogdians at their peak in the 7th to 8th century CE, we'll first go back to see them when they were insignificant nobodies 500 years prior. The Kushan Empire, which we saw in this video, was a great force throughout the Gangetic Plains, present-day Afghanistan, and parts of Xinjiang. They controlled the origins of trade networks stretching from the Indian subcontinent into Persia, the Roman Empire, and into distant China. Overland trade to China was conducted by skirting the Taklamakan Desert, either from the north or from the south. But trade over the desert was a risky endeavor. Historian Valerie Hansen notes in The Silk Roads in New History that overland exchanges consisted of valuable commodities in small volumes. But these could still generate enormous profits. As Judith uh, Lerner and Thomas Wilde write in their exhibition notes for the Smithsonian Institution, they were among the most demanded items in the ancient world, such as horses from the Fargana Valley, gemstones from India, musk from Tibet, and furs from the steppes to the north. The brilliant urban civilization of the Kushans, according to historian Etienne de la Vassière in her magisterial Sogdian trade as a history, quite outshone the very mediocre situation in Sogdiana, roughly the region corresponding to present-day southwest Uzbekistan and eastern Tajikistan. Sogdiana was somewhat of a backwater, situated off to the northeast of trade routes across the Taklamakan. In the 2nd century CE, Kushan merchants dominated the trade in horses, appearing as far afield as China and Southeast Asia. But Sogdian traders also began to participate in the same networks, emigrating and putting down roots in Kushan cities while maintaining ties to their homeland. Della Vassier notes that when the Karakoram Highway was built between present-day Pakistan and China, enormous amounts of Sogdian graffiti were discovered, suggesting that they were settling in the upper reaches of the Indus River by the 3rd century CE. One interesting bit of graffiti is a prayer by a Sogdian merchant to a local spirit, asking for protection so that he could visit his brother safely. Such family networks allowed Sogdians access to capital and market information and gave them a comparative advantage over other groups. At the same time, Sogdians also began to appear in China. In A Silk Road Legacy, The Spread of Buddhism and Islam, historian Sinryu Liu points out that the earliest Buddhist monks in China were not native Indians but Sogdians. In the 2nd and 3rd century CE, they were working in China, translating texts from Sanskrit into Chinese. Della Vassier notes that Buddhism was not a major force in Sogdiana at this time, and so these Sogdian Buddhist monks were most probably members of merchant families who had settled in India, where they had absorbed both Buddhism and Sanskrit before moving to China. While the concepts underlying Indian gods were quite ancient, they were never static entities. They were worshipped and patronized by diverse groups, and these impacted their evolution. We've seen this process quite clearly for Buddhism in this video, and it happened for Hinduism too. For example, as we explored here, the militant Kushans preferred to represent Skanda as Mahasena, literally great general, and melded him with various Iranic gods, including Shaoshta. Sogdian traders were exposed to these pluralistic pantheons and brought them back to their homeland. Their traditions melded local Iranic fire worship with these new imports, maintaining the distinctive Sogdian identity. To illustrate all this, let's look at Samarkand in present-day Uzbekistan, which was once the greatest of Sogdian city-states. 
Drawing on the testimony of the famous Chinese pilgrim Xuan Sang, Professor Sin Ryu Liu argues that in Samarkand, the Buddha was honored with processions of torches and firebrands. Though the Kushan Empire was torn apart by the 4th century CE, Sogdian diaspora networks outlived it and only continued to grow in prominence. By the 7th to 8th centuries, they were the dominant foreign traders in China, and Sogdian costumes and dance forms were all the rage in the cosmopolitan cities of Tang Dynasty China. By this point, there were also significant South Asian diasporas in Sogdiana, and Indian monks had begun to have prosperous careers in China as we saw here. The prosperity of Sogdiana can be seen in the mansions of wealthy merchants. Elaborate frescoes of gods, myths, and even Panchatantra stories offer a glimpse into their imaginations. A Sogdian engagement with foreign gods was the mirror of the imperial Kushan dynamic. While Kushan appropriation of Indian gods was driven by the imperial court, in Sogdiana it was a decentralized process being driven by diverse merchant elites. While Kushan conceptions influenced gods worshipped in India, Indian conceptions instead influenced gods worshipped in Sogdiana. The Zoroastrian gods of the Sogdians had many attributes, and this Indian cultural norm of multiple arms and faces allowed them to represent them in all their splendor. In Iranian gods in Hindu garb, art historian Franz Grenet cites Buddhist Sogdian texts which mention composite deities such as Brahma Zurwan, Indra Advag, Mahadeva Veshparkar. Their iconography was derived primarily from Indian models. Brahma Zurwan has a beard, Indra Advag a third eye, Mahadeva Veshparkar three faces. This last god follows on the lines of the ancient Kushan composite deity Oesho Shiva and is similarly a composite of a cosmic wind god with the supreme Shiva. In Panjikent in present-day Tajikistan, which was another major Sogdian city, Mahadeva Veshparkar was depicted blowing a horn with one of his three faces, making the connection to wind especially clear. Now, these borrowings could be dizzyingly complex, not intentionally, but rather as an organic assimilation. Layers of borrowing in all directions built up century over century. Grenet argues that in some cases, motifs moved from Gangetic to Kushan to Persian context before arriving in Sogdiana. And as a result of all this, 7th century Sogdians may not have necessarily thought of these motifs, these composite deities, as Indian or foreign. From their point of view, this was just how gods were represented. To them, these models were very much native to their cosmopolitan world. It's only with modern eyes accustomed to linking one religion with one language with one people with one region that the Sogdian pantheon seems particularly strange to us. But the silent frescoes of the dancing Shiva and Panjikant, or elephant riding gods battling tigers and leopards in Varaksha, challenge us to see this ancient world beyond national sentiment. Connections like this, though they don't reinforce modern political notions of superiority or exclusivity, make the world of our ancestors and our own infinitely richer. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anirbuddha and at Connected Histories and on Twitter at Ekanisati. We'll see you next week.